Alpha Omega London, maker of shoes, creators of waves in the fashion industry, introduces Fashion Vanguard's podcast. We aim to open minds, share knowledge, listen to opinions, and start conversations. Our podcast series unravels fashion's many guises and tackles head-on the current issues that matter, getting honest views from the mouths that matter. In this series, we'll be exploring how blockchain can impact the world of fashion by aiding transparency and supply chain, amongst other things. Now let's get real. When the 3D printer was first invented in, I think, the 80s, people thought it would change the world in no time. While it has gotten considerably more accessible and affordable, and it is being used in several industries with major breakthroughs in fields like medicine, it hasn't really gained the momentum that we thought it would. And this has happened with several technological inventions. It isn't always easy or even possible to predict what will be the next big thing and what won't. All this talk about blockchain has got me wondering, will blockchains really transform the fashion industry the way that it might the banking or financial sector, for instance? What does the future of fashion look like? And what's the approximate timeline we're looking at with regards to blockchains in fashion? In an effort to better understand and make others aware of tech innovations in fashion, we have some panelists with us today. They are Nazina, Gurdeep, Daniel, Raid, and myself, Ashwini. So to break that down, is blockchains likely to transform the fashion industry and compared to other industries like banking? What do you guys think? It'll be a staggered progression, I think. It's not going to move at the same pace. And I just think that's just the way the industry works. Plus, it's it's very expensive. I think, you know, certain interests need to be aligned in order for it to be effective. And, you know, there's a real kind of revolution in terms of how, you know, fashion companies and the, and the apparel sector really have to look at what they're doing and, and how they're doing it and why they're doing it really and I think blockchain is that's really where it, you'll get the emphasis on how effective the you know the sort of process or the the, the technology um is um and the impact it will have on the fashion business yeah I and I think in general agrees. with respect to supply chain because it's more a uh, greater good kind of thing but I mean of course we discussed how that can change as well but mm-hmm. um in ba- banking it's, I'm not sure that I completely understand it correct me if I'm wrong but it's a bit more like profitable possibly to banks for instance yeah. to use blockchain, to use blockchain. whereas so, yeah. in the supply chain like in fashion for instance where it's almost purely going to be applied only um in supply chain I mean we'll go into the details but mm. um there it's just less likely to be fast as fast I'd say yeah yeah you know absolutely it's going to change also the production and consumption you know sort of models that currently exist so it's it's just as I said it's just not going to happen overnight but that's judging from historical evidence and as I mentioned in the first episode you saw you know with the whole sort of retail apocalypse as an example of House of Fraser's uh, administration scenario it's you know it, there's a real slow uptake um, you know, particularly with technological innovation, um, and it's going to be much slower if it's if it's facing, you know, more towards social responsibility as opposed to profitability. Mm-hmm. And I mean, forget that. Do you think it's even possible? Do you think it will transform the fashion industry, or do you think it's just all talk and it's not actually going to happen? You can't just apply it and then it kind of does its <laughs> magic tricks. I think it's definitely. I feel. Um, an open door to possibilities and where and how it can be applied. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, no, I, it, it, it can only massively change the fashion industry. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe that's why it's going to take time because the implications are huge. And also, it's not just that. You're looking at other innovations. You're looking at AI. You're looking at 3D printing. And all of these combined... This is just going to complete, the landscape is just going to be completely different to what it is now over the next 10, 20, 30 years. I think it's got a lot to do with like patience as well, like how Mm -hmm. long the fashion industry can wait to transform the industry. Like we talked about sustainability in fashion is in dire need of like repair. 
how long much longer can you wait to you know so it's it's this idea about patience and if people are patient enough and you know having your own um, business you would know that like if you're not patient and you'll soon find out and i'm i'll soon find out as well and gerdy too if you if you're not patient you're just not you're going to be forcing something that doesn't want to be forced right mm. so yep. it's 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 a, a massive um undertaking and if like patience really when it comes to technology is something that we really need to appreciate because these things don't happen overnight you know a man didn't land on a moon overnight the first sent an animal into space you know there's mm-hmm. there's all of these things there or are did st- a man land on a moon oh <laughs> god <laughs> <laughs> um, was it not area based oh no i shouldn't say that <laughs> um you don't know you don't know who's listening <laughs> Um, um, yeah so all of the every technological innovation has layers so I mean on that I think I'd agree with Ashwini it's it's, it's about money it's about you know uh, for banking if they can turn a a little bit extra profit by using blockchain then Mm -hmm. they're all for it if if in fashion that isn't the case then it's going to be a little bit they're going to be a bit slower on the uptake really the way I see it is that if you're a business there are two things that mean you up your profit and mean that you'll go down with your profit. It's going to be whether or not you're selling uh, more or less of whatever it is that you're selling. Um, so if it, if blockchain and the whole sustainability drive means that sales are going to go up, then great. You're probably going to go and implement it a little bit faster. Yeah. If, if, if it means that you're going to have to increase the cost of production and that's hurting sales, then frankly, things are going to be a bit slower. Mm-hmm. The other thing is things like legal, ethical, reputational risk. If you, uh, if, if the law changes or has changed such that it, it, you know, the best way to meet the requirements of the law is using blockchain technology, then expect the uptake to be quick. If those requirements aren't there, if there isn't the reputational risk there, if there isn't the ethical risk there, then expect the uptake to be slow. But then it's more of a chicken and egg issue. Um, how are you going to generate the deserved uh, ethical issue which is oh there's modern slavery going on and and uh, wherever it is whichever tier it is in the manufacturing process without using blockchain but um, how are you going to use blockchain unless you've demonstrated that particular ethical risk so if you can sort that issue out quick Mm. um, you can sort that ethical risk issue the chicken and egg problem quicker and if you can maybe show how it has an effect on sales then expect things to steam along um, if if not, then then don't expect anything. I think Ashwini raised the three D printing issue. Three D printing started in the eighties, but it was expensive. There's tons of intellectual property annoyances stuck on it, and then once those things left, then it was it was cheaper to get stuff done. And so people are people are buying three D printers by the dozen. So <laughs> it's just it's just a matter of uh, having the right conditions. In banking, it's a little bit more um, open to that, but in, in in fashion, if 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 people can get their act together and meet those conditions I outlined, then I don't see why it can't move along at a yeah. significant pace. Yeah, really but those are big conditions. Those are big conditions. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good summary, mm-hmm. I think, of the, the issues yeah. that are faced. So what do you guys think the future of fashion will look like once it has been implemented, whenever that is? It's like Zoolander with the sort of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what was that? The hobo chic or something? Or something like that? Yeah, that's... Uh, what do you picture it to be? What about Nesbitt and Gritty? What, what do you think from a fashion perspective? Well, I think it's going to allow us to have more change. More, well, sorry, more, more, more choice. Yeah, it's going to allow choice. for consumers to have more choice. Ethically and sustainably. Right. Mm-hmm. And this is going to massively change the sort of the, the, the sway the pendulum i guess of power the power is definitely going to be in the consumer's arena Mm -hmm. and with that i mean that's what we spoke about in sustainability it was establishing who has the greater power to make the change and we obviously mentioned all the different stakeholders from you know government from top all the way down and um I think with this, the reason why I'm, I'm I'm quite sort of intrigued by blockchains is because it does open up that slight sort of, you know, light of hope where us mm-hmm. as the consumers can have a far greater impact on the habits that these producers are currently adopting that are making both our environments, you know, more 
inhabitable and and also creating products that are just completely unsustainable so you know how does that impact on me well I care because guess what you know I'm a human being you know I live and flourish in this world that I feel should be you know kept and maintained well I want to be able to you know, contribute towards that maintenance for the better of not just myself, not just my kids, but to everybody else. And I guess that's just, you know, the way things are now. People are just becoming that way inclined. So that just means that if I can go to a shop and with my phone scan an item and find out all the different, you know, sort of um, points of... Plans that's ex- Right, <laughs> throughout the supply chain. And I have information and it's very visible for me to see what those suppliers, who those suppliers are, where they're based, and maybe all the different, I guess, um, you know, associated, uh, you know, issues that they may have with them. If I can see all of that, then that's gonna make me make an informed change or choice. It, It will give me that choice to be able to, you know, decide on whether I purchase that product or not. So yeah, I, I'm, I, I don't think I'll just be a consumer that consumes. I think I'll be a consumer that's much more conscious. And mm-hmm. <laughs> also I think you place intrinsic value. When you see the complicated supply chain uh-huh. process of a, of a fashion brand, particularly if it's large, you don't just see a t-shirt, you see a t-shirt True, that's just gone through so much. So mm. then you dis- it psychologically, mm. It's not going mm-hmm. to just be a 40 quid t-shirt that you're thinking, well, that's justified because you can see the whole process. So yeah. I think True. actually it's going to change the way we view and clothing value general, clothing. And like consumer, yeah. like Consu- psychology. Consumer general, culture is going to change. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say on the note of like future, um, right now there's a massive disconnect between the fashion industry in the new age and the brands right and then a further disconnect from the fashion industry and the consumer so there's like almost if you think about that as a supply chain Mm. there's a massive disconnect in what people think they're doing and what people are actually doing yeah so Mm -hmm. having spoken to companies in the past and knowing about the fact that they are trying their hardest to implement sustainability policy and i know there's a brand in particular h&m who've Mm -hmm. gone through a lot of um you know, problems because their sustainability report isn't just enough, their sustainability report isn't this enough or whatever. H&M, on a very, very accredited uh, benchmarking system, was Mm. ranked sixth out of 99 fashion brands for sustainability and ethical policies. Mm -hmm. Or six or seven. Yeah. So it's not just this idea about, yeah, what can blockchain do? Mm. It's about what can blockchain do to change the community we live in? Yeah. In the sense that, in the fashion community, for example. So, can blockchain bridge the gap between the brands and the fashion industry, the new age of fashion industry? Yeah. Can yeah. it then bridge the gap further between those people and the consumers? Mm. And if it can do that, it's successful no matter how well it's implemented. Yeah. Because there needs to be more cooperation. I don't think blockchain is going to get any anywhere far if there's no cooperation between those three things. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's millennials like us and um, we... We demand to be to know how things are done yeah. because we can get information at the click of a finger, right? Right. right. So with cooperation, I, I I wouldn't go as far to say transparency, but with cooperation, there can be a, a trusted, and it would almost go back to like how people used to do deals in the past on trust. You know, if I didn't know Rahid's family, I would never make a deal with Rahid, mm, right? That's a really good point. <laughs> Just a quick reminder, you're listening to the Fashion Vanguard's EO London podcast. Please subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on, give us a review, and carry on the protest. Enjoy the rest of the podcast. So I think we've discussed quite in detail um supply chain sustainability blockchain all of these things and i'm just wondering one last thing is there any other way blockchain can be used 
in fashion in particular that's not supply chain or sustainability I did, I did, I did mention authenticity so you've got the counterfeit mm. you know issue mm. uh-huh. um, and sort of being able to differentiate between what is fake and what isn't you know you've got the the whole sort of IP um, issue as well um, which I think is is really it's so integral in particularly within the creative space and um, yeah I think I think that's that's definitely going to be um, revolutionary because I think a lot of brands have a hell of a lot of issues with counterfeit goods I think Burberry not too long ago yeah, burnt Louis Vuitton that as they, well well that the, the Burberry one. incinerated a lot of their oh um, yeah there was a lot yeah, of their, yeah. their, really? their yeah. additional clothes yeah could have given it to homeless people or something well yeah. again but a sustainability that issue value again mm. yeah. so that, Bur- that's Burberry is part of this um this commission, because obviously the, the the prime minister that we have in office now is the person who um, commissioned the Mon Slavery Bill, yeah. you know, right. and then Mo- uh, Theresa May. She's yeah. massive on that. She mentioned it in her Davos statement earlier mm-hmm. this year. Mm. Um, so Burberry, along with other big companies, um, mm. are involved in this in this commission, um, which look at human rights and modern slavery issues. So that builds into the sustainability issue when Burberry. You know, that was something that was discussed at the committee because you can, it's publicly, um, you know, accessible information. So it is interesting that you mentioned Burberry because they are involved in a very high level um, discussion with mm. government officials as well as other companies and how they can improve their sustainability, improve their social and environmental sustainability mm-hmm. amongst in this cooperative effort. And I think that cooperative effort goes from C-suite lemmings like Sir Rahid talked <laughs> about mm. all the way down to the un- uneducated on fashion and sustainability mm. you know so if that's interesting but i don't understand why they would burn their clothes i mean <laughs> they, they did purport to say that they did it because they didn't want it to fall in the yes. wrong hands yeah, and yeah. it was for counterfeit yeah. issues but yeah i mean how can you be so responsible from a sustainability perspective and, and actually i mean it is horrible but that... if you look at it from their perspective what mm. could what could they have done to not reduce their brand value? Find the really, tiniest it's reputation. Really good looking homeless people. <laughs> <laughs> well, they could give it to me. I wouldn't mind a bunch of free Burberry <laughs> merchandise. I would yeah, give them to uh, like Position. fashion students. There, yeah, there, there's, it, there that, it is. Thank yeah. you. You oh, donate it. Totally you do donate that. it to fashion cause. schools. Donate it to fashion schools. And then use it as a case study. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, yeah, about yeah. like you know, you know that I'm sorry, but in. There's more environmental just, yeah, risk I mean, obviously that's from horrible. burning clothes Thank you. Than, than like, yeah, it, it, you know, boy, when you burn something, you release CO2 right. and CO2 is the thing that's right. destroying our planet. It's probably their cheapest option. That's probably yeah. why they did it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's also just... you've got to remember all these supply chains were based off competitive, you know, if yeah. you, you know, a supply chain is made off economic purpose. Mm. It was never to make people happy. Mm-hmm. Social, mm-hmm. there was no social purpose to a supply that's chain. That's so true. You know, yeah. no one ever, th- no one ever. True, was to... where can you get this done cheapest? Yeah, and no... just send it over no there. One was, no one ever, no, no one was like, hey, look, I want to change people's lives. Let me build a really socially responsible supply chain. <laughs> yeah. No one in the, in the mankind ever said that. Yeah. The reason why supply chains are so screwed up is because because China, mm. India, mm. Um, all the developing BRIC yep. countries, Emerging Brazil, markets. you yep. know, all, yep. all yep. those com- countries, they came in with cheaper options. Yeah, mm-hmm. That means that the big companies had to outsource and create cheaper supply, ch- supply chains. And this right. is the reason why social sustainability is so, like, so much of a buzzword now, because mm. social sustainability is a new thing. Yeah. yeah you yeah. know, supply chains were made off of economic gain yeah rather than and this is how globalization happened and this yeah. is why you know we can all mm-hmm. sit in the same room and be from different countries you know it's yeah. it, it's the whole reason why everything happens yeah, you know? yeah. so just um briefly on the authenticity point that you raised earlier yeah. the there is a major pitfall to that so i, I was speaking with um a c-suite person who's not a lemming and, uh, and he runs a <laughs> blockchain company and they they're sort of a consultancy they were speaking with a french wine manufacturer Mm-hmm. And the French wine manufacturer said, well, we need to have authentic wine sold. We don't want to be you know, mixed up with all the counterfeits. And they were keen on using a blockchain solution. Mm. However, just because you use blockchain doesn't mean some malicious actor can't go in, uncork it, take out the authentic wine, put in the bleach or whatever, mm, and, then, and then sell it on. Same thing can happen with clothes. Some malicious actor can break into the crate that's shipping across, I don't know, the Mediterranean or whatever, mm. uh, re- and replace stuff, or, or, or some corrupt um, mm-hmm. person in the supply chain decides to do something naughty. Uh, that means that the supposed authenticity that you have 
supposedly guaranteed by the blockchain it's completely is lost in one step. Yeah. And that's there why that's exactly. why logistics has so many of the sustainability issues that yeah. are so not, unco- not, exactly. not covered because they're not considered to be part of the supply chain exactly. but actually they're more part of it than the things that you actually consider. I mean as 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 I know I'm going to sound biased here but a lot of these issues are tackled by creating the right laws mm-hmm. and enforcing the right mm-hmm. laws. These are these yeah, these are cases it as well. and enforcing enforcing, exactly. enforcing enforcing is a massive issue because yeah. the Modern Slavery Act is not enforced. I mean, I mean, a, a lot of the beauty of blockchain, really? as you said, is about consumer awareness, right? Mm. So that that's big and that helps enforce things. Actually, there's mm-hmm. no there's no but, fine if you don't yeah. report. There's no fine. There's mm. nothing in the law that says there's a fine. Like you can read it, yeah. you can tell me otherwise, but the Modern Slavery Act doesn't have. And they're trying to do amendments, but because of Brexit law, they can't, you know, yeah. can't do anything right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. And that's why Australia are implementing their own. And that's why France implemented their own. But there's nothing that says that, look, I think it's like a £10,000 fine. But to a £36 million yeah, turnover company, £10,000 is yeah. what they pay their, like, cleaner. And, 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 that's another, and that's another problem. I would love to be a cleaner. And, and, and that's another problem. And that's another problem with human rights. And you, can, you compare it with the GDPR, which just has come out, and it says that your fine can be up to 4% of your, your worldwide turnover. Yeah. Mm. And that's a data protection. I mean, data protection is important, but uh, treating people not like slaves, I think, is, is, a, little, also is a little bit more important. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh-huh. and, and yeah, so it, yeah, there needs to be a change in the law. And, and you know what I'd say to anyone who's a, a fashionista of some kind, who's interested in this particular uh, field, I'd say, talk to your local MP. I'd say, badger um, change, badger lobbying groups, get parliamentarians to make this change happen. Because if they don't do it, nothing's really gonna happen. Blockchain is a solution, but it's not really at all a panacea. The panacea is, uh, again, I'm biased, is law, good law, well-enforced law. I think the, the 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 emphasis is on well, well good inf- like well enforced law. Mm. If you can enforce law, because mm. if the Modern Slavery Act was enforced, because I think the compliance on Modern Slavery Act is forty six percent rubbish, forty six percent right. That is awful. Yeah, amount of company you think about the fifty four percent of thirty six million pound turnover companies that aren't reporting on their modern slavery and human rights issues. Mm-hmm is incredible and most of them sit on FTSE Mm -hmm. you know most of them are publicly listed and that's crazy and I think publicly listed companies are a bit higher up I think it's like 55% but still like why isn't there more enforcement and you know if you have they're now saying in France in in Australia the amendment to because it's very similar law Mm. um, in Australia they're going to say if you have an office based in Australia um, you're your your modern slavery report has to do this and you have to publish it in the UK as the same. So, you know, and if you, mm. it, you can't like that, you know, the law is going to be almost an addition. It's going to be the UK amendment that needs to happen in this com- country, just in a Commonwealth country. You know? Right. So um, that is a, it's a really, you know, the law side of things. I, I don't know the deep side. I don't like study law, but I understand from a very super structural level about, you know, California, UK, France, Australia, um, Netherlands are trying to do something on child labour, but they can't because if they say that they're not going to buy anything that's child labour, then that destroys and cripples their whole com- com- yeah, country. Yeah, yeah. You know, so there's very interesting developments that are going on, mm. um, but there is a lot of backlash because <laughs> it's a very difficult to say. Yeah, I'm not going to buy anything child labour, and then not have any food or anything come through the door for months and months and months <laughs> because you've declared you don't well, want it. In to those know. developing countries, they need to alter the law. I think that's in, yep. in, that's uh, that's key. You can't. Yep. Because they're the ones who are, it, it, but they're not. It's... They're not sure about human rights issues. They're not. They're not aware. You know, Malaysia, Cambodia, they have no idea. Like Malaysia mm-hmm. more, but Cambodia, Laos. Yeah. You know, there's a com- there's a there's a think tank called the Asara Institute. They work with uh, Pentland Brands, right? Mm-hmm. They 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 do work and like putting people in p- people from Pentland straight into uh, factories, right? The laws are not changing. The laws will not change until yeah. there's more and more companies lobbying. So yes, people need to lobby companies, but the companies need to lobby governments in those right. developing countries. You have against as, their own interests. As, yes, as, as sad mm. as it may be, as sad as it may be, we do not have the power over other countries. The mm. only people that have power over those other countries other companies. are other companies. Got it. So you've got to. And this comes back to a point that I was saying. Sustainability has got this really big problem of blaming companies for yeah. like what they don't do. Yeah. If people supported companies to lobby governments, you yeah. get so much further. 
And that's a a really good point. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you've both spoken about that because that really is an action point that I think we need to press upon if we're going to you know, make make a substantial change. Because com- companies have done that for years. Like yeah. McDonald's has been doing that for glo- with glocalization. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you know what glocalization is. Yeah. It's basically where they take, um, m- m- like, you know, McDonald's will go into um, India and make the McAlu tiki or what, yeah. whatever, yeah. right? They'll yeah. make it accustomed to the culture there. Yeah. They've been doing it for years. They've yeah. had influence over governments for years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They just need to now use it in the right way, (laughs) you know? They need to not impinge on the culture. They need to make sure the culture is enriched with how human rights can be beneficial Mm. for everyone in that country. India is a perfect example. Over a Mm. billion people, they have a democratic system, you know? They have a democratic system. It's the biggest democracy in the world, Mm. but there are so many human rights problems. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, maybe if we are lobbying the companies that do have that sort of political control over, you know, countries, maybe we need to maybe they need to reflect or change their business models because if your business model is purely hinged on making a profit you're not going to entertain any other you know additional business right. absolutely. you know requisite yeah. absolutely but the, the problem also lies with the fact that they're too busy trying to defend themselves against all the backlash that they get from people about their sustainability policies are right. bad or that they don't have the time nor resources to do that right the, you know I, I my reservation is this um there is a very famous example of a movement that boycotts a particular country because of its practices right that's obviously the boycott israel mo- mm-hmm. movement right mm-hmm. now Let's say instead of now, boycott Israel has you know, lots of questions around, et cetera, et cetera. But forget Israel for a second. You're saying, say, Lao, for example. Yeah. If you start suddenly started saying boycott Lao, the obvious retort is, well, what about those people who are just trying to get by? Yes, under horrible conditions, but they're just trying to make a little bit of a living so that they can put mm-hmm. some food yeah. on their family's dinner yeah. table mm-hmm. every night. And suddenly we in the West who are buying our three pound Primark T-shirt say, oh, no, no, we're boycott- boycotting Lao. So it means no food on their table. Yeah. No food on the Lao people. Yeah. So now that that's a big issue. That's the big. That is a really big issue, and I'm glad you brought it up because that's what's happening in the Netherlands. Right. So in the Netherlands, they're trying to ban all products being imported that have had tarnishing of child labor. Yeah. That's the thing that, and it got to the second stage, and then they realized, oh wait, if we do this, then we're going to be taking away because the child is normally the one that has to go to work, right? Because the the yeah. parent has to do something else, or they're in a or you know they were child laborers as well you know so you know they they now can't work at the age of 30 you know like that that sort of crazy stuff so if we do that we take away their source of income Mm -hmm. so how do we so that's a debate that's going on in the netherlands right now it's not really going on many other places because sustainability is one of those things like you'd love to think about it yeah and then when you actually think about it you like uh i can't deal with it because it it puts a lot of (laughs) It puts a magnifying glass, and it's a transparency underneath, issue. underneath econ- economic models. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they are the very basis and the constructs of yeah. you know these business models. Yeah. And if our if our if if business models' primary search for profit and growth was wasn't an issue, then we wouldn't be in this particular scenario. But no. we are under a capitalist yeah. system. And, and and to be fair, countries lax regulation because they yeah. see. Yeah. There's, there's profits to be made for their companies right. and perhaps for their back pockets. Um, mm-hmm. So they just they take it, take it back. So best thing to do. I mean, when uh, Western countries have an issue with Russia or North Korea, they implement economic sanctions. What's yeah. being proposed here is consumer led economic sanctions, practically. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm-hmm. When do economic sanctions work? Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. It depends on the how strong that country is alone. If you try to put economic sanctions on, say, Chinese manufacturing, yeah, you're not going to win because uh, ch- <laughs> China can look after itself. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but say on Lao, then you need everybody to come together, not just yeah. the Netherlands. Yeah. You need everybody to say, no, we're maybe this is going to sound kind of Trumpian here, but banning trade yeah. with this with yeah. this particular country. Mm. Um, and then that country, through the bullying of the Western imperialist states, which is exactly yeah. how it's going to play yeah. out, just yeah. to be clear, yeah. um, will acquiesce and change yeah. their laws for the better. Yeah. And the, and the thing is, the thing is that like. We can we could go on about it and like go into many many layers of how this would play out. Yeah. But the the real the problem is that like there still is this massive disconnect between the way 
fashion is perceived yeah. or sustainability is perceived mm. and how it actually plays out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's the major issue. And I think what you're talking about is well, you mentioned it, cooperation. You know, mm. you mentioned it in an imperialistic and, you know, that's very like war torn yeah, yeah, yeah. like example but you use cooperation to make your point yeah. Yeah. i'm using cooperation to make my point i think everyone would agree that it'd be a much happier place yeah. and a much progressive time if people were more cooperative you know if you know the activists um understood how the fashion industry works from a very granular perspective you know not super structural there's there's layers to things so i think if people have an understanding and want to have an understanding of how things work they can then be more civically and politically engaged in it a really positive example is uh, as i mentioned in a previous episode apartheid south africa mm. the, there's a huge amount of boycotting of all sorts of activities going on in apartheid south africa and obviously as i mentioned in a previous episode things you know got better um that's an example of something done well. In in essence, let me let me put it this way: <laughs> if you're if you're a if you're a fashion industry person and you want to solve sustainability, see if you can do the same thing that Nelson Mandela did. If you can if you can reach that standard, then you know credit to you. Uh, but um, well, it, yeah, so, yeah, he did it, so there's no reason why no one else could do it. established that blockchains will form an integral part in changing the fashion industry, but not to the pace of sectors such as banking due to the lack of financial incentive. However, we believe that it will happen sometime in the future, making the landscape of fashion much more sustainable.